Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. The first casualty of the Trump administration that is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. National Security Chief Michael Flynn has resigned. General got into trouble over a phone call he had with the Russian ambassador before, before Donald Trump took office. The issue centered on sanctions President Obama slapped on Russia. Apparently, General Flynn discussed that with the Russian. Michael Flynn should have known that his call was being taped, both by American and Russian intelligence agencies, that's standard. But then things get foggy. I don't know what General Flynn said. Nobody knows at this point, except government officials, because there is a transcript of the conversation as yet unreleased. But according to Fox News correspondent John Roberts, General Flynn misled Vice President Pence about the content of the call. And that is the big reason he was fired. Vice President Pence wields a lot of power in the White House right now, and subordinates simply cannot mislead him. So the Trump administration is now searching for a new national security advisor. The story really ends here, unless General Flynn was ordered to say something to the Russians that was inappropriate. Again, speculating on that, foolish, if evidence surfaces, we'll certainly report it. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect on the Flynn saga is the PR component. Yesterday, Kellyanne Conway said the general was safe. General Flynn does enjoy the full confidence of the president, and this is a big week for General Flynn. He's the point of contact for many of these foreign visits. Now, did Ms. Conway mislead, or did she not know the general was in trouble? Either way, not a good situation. Talking Points well understands the complexities of running this country, but it's becoming clear that President Trump needs better coordination among his staff. Should be somebody in charge of quality control and accurate messaging. That someone should be Chief of Staff, Rens Priebus, who is experienced and skilled. No way Kellyanne Conway should be out saying all's fine with General Flynn when all was not fine. A kind of confusion doesn't do anyone in this country any good especially because President Trump has legions of people trying to hurt him. Summing up, Flynn is out, new security person will be appointed, and the Trump White House needs to become better organized. And that's the memo. Now for the top story, how is President Trump doing according to the folks? New Fox News poll just out, spotlights that. Do you approve of Trump's executive order on immigration? 46% say yes, 52% no. Should the order, the immigration order, be described as a terrorist hotspot restriction or a Muslim ban? 56% restriction, 37% ban. Does the order make the USA safer, less safe, no difference? Safer, 42%, less safe, 33 no difference, 24 Next, President Trump's job approval rating. Approve, 48%, disapprove, 47%. Finally, are you confident in Donald Trump's judgment in a crisis? 50% are confidence, 49% are not. In October, that number was 43% confident, 56% no. So it has been a gain for the president there. But it's clear the country remains divided on President Trump. If does build that wall, Mexico ought to stop helping the United States, even if that means allowing terrorists into this country. He'll join us to discuss that plan. Also, many in the press have been accused of biased reporting recently. A reporter from the Washington Post will be here to explain whether that's a valid criticism or not. But first, General Michael Flynn, we hardly knew ye. The National Security Advisor is gone after less than a month in the White House. He was brought down after his conversation with Russia's ambassador to the United States was wiretapped by U.S. intelligence, despite protections that are supposed to block such wiretapping of U.S. citizens. Perhaps Flynn deserved to go for apparently lying to the Vice President, but even if he did, what does it say about U.S. intelligence that it may be spying on the administration? Congressman Ruben Gall Gallego uh, of Arizona was one of the Democrats who demanded the firing of General Flynn, and he joins us now. Congressman, thanks all for coming on. Thank you, Tucker, for so, having me. As you know, the law requires a warrant from the FISA court in order to proceed with a wiretapping such as this. And the law specifies that if an American citizen is caught up in that wiretapping, that his identity be protected and the content of his side of the conversation also be protected that didn't happen and somehow this information was leaked to the press. Are you for that? No, clearly we're not for that. Clearly we want every American to have their due process and have their civil rights defended. Yeah. Um, also at the same time, like there's something that's been very questionable that's going on 
uh, we believe obviously that this was in the course of some type of wiretapping of the Russians and they happened to actually catch somebody else in the process. But at the same time, you know, I think the best way to answer this is to have a full investigation. Let's have this uh -huh. go through the proper process so that way if there is anything questionable, questionable about what occurred, that that does get fleshed out. And I think General Flynn is owed that and I think the American public is owed that. Well, I, I agree. I agree with you completely. But here's what we already know. We don't, by the way, know exactly the content of this conversation, because as far as I know, there are no copies of the transcript. Have you seen the transcript yourself? No, we have not, which is why I think an okay, investigation so, at some point or another right, would be no, that, more valid. Th that's, th that sounds right to me. Uh, so we can proceed with the knowledge that we're ignorant of what exactly was said. But we know something was said. But we know for a fact that a U.S. intelligence agency wiretapped an American citizen, a private citizen. He was not uh, a part of the U.S. government at the time in December when this happened. And they leaked it to the press. Now, is there anything more dangerous, really, than a U.S. intelligence agency, which exists to monitor activities abroad, foreign governments, turning against a political enemy and destroying him. Whatever you think of Flynn or his fitness for the office, that's the most disturbing part of this, isn't it? Well, I think the more dangerous part is some type of subterfuge that was going on with our election, if there was any kind of collusion with a campaign, whether they know it or not. Now, obviously, that this is something that we should investigate, and, that's, and I agree, I'm very happy you agree with me, Tucker, on that. Uh, but that's what needs to happen here. And if there was some type of uh, illegal manner that this was obtained that violated General Flynn's uh, rights, then we should investigate that also. But at the same time, something went wrong here. Um, we know that General Flynn lied uh, to the vice president, made uh, the current president uh, at least somehow be embarrassed by this. Uh, and, you know, there needs to be an investigation. This is why we have oversight as Congress. No, at actually, point, you've, you've got it exactly... You've got it backwards. Now, clearly something went wrong between Flynn and the president and the vice president, but we don't know. We don't know that he lied because we don't know the contents of his conversation. So we actually don't know that. What we do know is that the leaking of his identity is illegal. Like, we know that. That's not speculation. We don't need an investigation to ascertain that. And we know that it came from an intelligence agency because they're the ones that do the spying. So here's what you have. You have bureaucrats whom nobody elected seeking to undermine the elected representatives of the United States government. Isn't that, again, a threat to the way we run our country, to the democracy itself? You can't have the intelligence agencies going rogue, can you? Well, I think the bigger threat to democracy is an international uh, entity such as uh, what we saw Russia getting involved in our elections. But again, I think what you bring up is a very valid point. This is why we should have an investigation, and it should cover all aspects of this, too. Uh, you know, General but, but, but Flynn, wait, wait, hold on. Sure wait, wait, why would we person. need an investigation? Again, we agree on the investigation part. I'm always for more information, pretty much. But since we already know that, I'm just wondering why it's not at the very center of your concern. Since the intelligence agencies, just as you know, since you're a member of Congress, went to Harvard, you know that they exist to gather intelligence for the president in order that he might make foreign policy. Their purpose is not to make foreign policy, much less to execute it. It's to give the president information so that he can do that. But it looks really clear in this case, they disagreed with the president's foreign policy and they're trying to undermine it. Well, That's a know, scary thing. Well, we don't know what actually was occurring in the background of it, which uh, you know I think is very valid for all of us to be concerned and ask questions. But I think also, again, like I agree with you, Tucker, the best way to flesh this out is through a proper investigation. We know General Flynn was in contact with uh, the ambassador. We know he was in violation of a tradition where there's only one president at one time. We know that he at least misrepresented his conversation with the president and the vice president. We know that the attorney general, I'm sorry, not attorney general, the assistant attorney general Department of Justice had actually warned the White House about this situation. Uh, and there is just a lot of questions that are still out there. The best well, way to solve but, 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 this but, but, is wait, for wait, us wait to a have an what do you mean investigation. He's... Look, I'm not, I'm not here to defend what, what defend what Flynn did because, like you, I'm not really sure what Flynn did. He says he did not discuss sanctions, he did not promise to lighten the load on Russia or anything like that. But again, we don't know, neither you nor I. But what do you mean he was the tradition of only one president at a time? You're not suggesting that U.S. citizens don't have a right to call officials, either of this government or other governments. And I feel like I have a right to do that, don't you? Uh, you have a right to do that, but not when you are so close to a campaign that you're trying to influence the diplomatic outcome. Um, the president wa at that point was President Obama. Jerome Flynn was uh, potentially involving himself uh, in within the relationship between the United States uh, and Russia. The president had just issued sanctions regarding um, you know, violations of what we assumed were tampering uh, by Russian intelligence. And the right. fact that he called right afterwards... Uh, I think is questionable. And I think, again, this yeah, is why we well, should have an investigation. 
Okay, but, but again, here's what we know that the U.S. government is spying on American citizens and not keeping that information secret. Now, you're, you know, I don't think you're some kind of crazy lefty, but you're on the left, and the left has a long tradition of standing up for civil liberties. And the most basic civil liberty of all, as you often say, is privacy. And you need that as a yeah. prerequisite for freedom. So if you don't have any privacy from the U.S. government spying on you, like things fall apart. Why aren't you more upset about that? Well, I think also we may have to understand what actually is going on here. We have a um, Republican Congress that's not exactly doing oversight right now. And for all we know, and this is why we have to have an investigation, that our uh, you know, whistleblowers, if, if we want to call them that, may have felt that they weren't getting the attention that was needed to something that was extremely uh, a dangerous situation. Again, let's remember that the Attorney General... Wait, 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 well, if you, have no oversight, if you have no oversight that's actually occurring by any entity within the government, and at the same time, you have the Assistant Attorney General who warned the Trump administration that there is potential leaking and blackmailing situation with someone like General Flynn who is sitting within the National Security Council, this is a very serious situation. So again, wait, but hold on. First of all, wait. Uh, there's, there's no. Uh, that was her personal assessment. Whether it's true or not, we don't know. But you seem to. I just want you to say unequivocally, you should not break the law by spying on U.S. citizens and then leaking illegally the contents of those conversations to the Washington Post. Like, if we can't agree that that's a bad thing, then what's the basis for a conversation? Here? Like, just agree, if you would, that that's out of bounds or should be. Well, I think any U.S. citizen has certain privacy rights that we should all respect. I think General Flynn may yeah. have crossed the line. And at the same time, I'm willing to investigate this and actually look at this at the full scope of what occurred there. And if General Flynn's violations, if there's any violations that actually occurred, General Flynn, then that should also be remedied, too. At the same time... What do you mean? We, we, know that they occur we, we know that they occurred. Again, that's not a debate point. We know as a factual matter that the law was violated. So we'll just, let's just say that. It doesn't mean that Flynn's a great guy, just, but the law was violated. Right? Well, I think of an investigation would actually give us more information okay. than just us speculating back and forth. Again, look, that's the Assistant not Attorney General said, said that this person... That's the one part of our conversation that's not the, speculation. Well, look, the Assistant Attorney General said that this person right. is potentially compromised, could potentially blackmailed, and is sitting okay, in very sensitive situations. Right. Well, this is a very still serious illegal situation. illegal to leak his name, period. All At right. the same time, this right is why time. we should have a full investigation about what occurred. All right. I got that. Congressman, thanks a lot. Thank you, Tucker. Well, General Flynn's downfall has already hindered President Trump's overtures toward Russia. Now, tonight, there are even more signs it may be very difficult to build a friendly relationship with the regime in that country. For more, we go to Fox News correspondent Trace Gallagher. Hey, Trace. Tucker, the administration is now acknowledging that President Trump has known for weeks that former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn misled the White House about his contact with Russia, but the president was waiting to make sure there was nothing illegal about Flynn's conversations with the Russian ambassador to the U.S. concerning U.S. sanctions. But Democratic lawmakers and some Republicans are calling for a full inquiry, not just into Flynn's discrepancies, but into the overall White House ties to Russia. At the same time, a Russian spy ship is now patrolling off the the East Coast. At last check, the Victor Leonov was 70 miles off the coast of Delaware in international waters. The Leonov can intercept communications, measure, measure U.S. Navy sonar, and carry surface-to-air missiles. This is the closest a Russian vessel has gotten to the U.S. since Donald Trump took office. U.S. officials say the ship is not a huge concern, but they are watching it. And it also appears Russia has deployed two battalions of ground-launched cruise missiles in separate Russian Russian territories. That violates a U.S.-Russian treaty banning intermediate land-based missiles. The Pentagon now has to decide whether to deploy additional missile defense system in Europe. And we have confirmed that last Friday, Russian fighter jets conducted what the U.S. military calls dangerously close flybys of a U.S. military vessel into the Black Sea. The U.S. says the fighter jets were at an unusually low altitude and unusually high speed, and the Russians ignored U.S. calls to halt the flybys. Finally, the Office of Government Ethics says Kellyanne Conway broke the law and the rules, rather, by hawking Ivanka Trump's clothing line on Fox & Friends last week. The OGE is recommending disciplinary action. The White House says Conway has been counseled. Again, whatever that means. Tucker. Trace Gallagher, thanks a lot.
Up next, a former Mexican government official says his government ought to clog up the U.S. court system and allow terrorists into this country, all to interfere with President Trump's immigration policies. He'll be here to explain that plan after the break. Also, the press mangled their coverage of the 2016 race and don't seem to have improved much since then. We'll ask Washington Post media reporter whether journalists are letting bias poison their minds and corrupt their souls. Stay tuned. A politician has a novel idea to keep his countrymen from being deported back to the homeland. Just ruin the American court system. Jorge Castaneda was once Minister of Foreign Affairs for Mexico's government under Vicente Fox. He's also a professor at NYU and a board member for Human Rights Watch. He recently called on the Mexican government to fund lawyers who will clog up the U.S. immigration courts as much as possible intentionally in order to prevent deportations back to Mexico. Castaneda has also denounced a wall on the Mexican border, saying that if President Trump persists in building it, Mexico should allow terrorists to enter this country freely in retaliation. Jorge Castaneda joins us tonight. Jorge, thanks all for coming on. So I, I want Thank to you for read you me. a really... For our viewers who haven't seen this, this is a quote from a couple of weeks ago, you to the New York Times, and you said this, Mexico must say clearly that we will encourage all potential deportees to demand a hearing upon arrest and to refuse voluntary removal, that we will provide legal support on our dime for all arrested undocumented workers, and that we will deny entry to anyone whom Mexican, American authorities cannot prove is a Mexican national. This seems like a change. When did the Mexican government develop this concern for due process? Well, it's not the Mexican government. I am not a government official. I left the government 14 years ago, and I speak only for myself. I've always been a firm okay. believer in due process in Mexico and everywhere in the world. And consequently, I think that this is one of the most admirable things the U.S. has, and Mexico should use it. I don't recall the United States letting people in who, are not, who do not prove that they are American. Well, I don't want the U.S. to deport anybody to Mexico who the U.S. cannot prove is Mexican. And yes, I want to use as much as possible the U.S. judicial system, the court system, and in particular immigration courts and judges to ja jam the system, to backlog it so much that perhaps President Trump will change his mind and stop this ridiculous, uh, unpleasant, hostile policy of deporting people. Today he even, they even uh, arrested a fellow, a young dreamer in Seattle, Ricardo Ramirez Medina, a 23 year old who is in the US legally, who has a work permit to work legally. They went after his father and they got well, him presumably too, they'll let even him, though they'll, he they'll has a go. written promise. Well, I don't so know if they'll let him go. They, for the moment, they haven't arrested him. So, yes, I yeah. want to use the well, U.S. Living in legal Mexico, system I, I, presumably to you're stop used the to deportation. In the justice yes. system. But let me ask you, so you're suggesting, look, as a foreign national, you're suggesting destroying our legal system because you don't think the U.S. government has the right, as the president has stated, to deport people who've been convicted of felonies. And you're saying that they should resist. Well, I, can't, I wouldn't be destroying it. How, how can I suggest destroying it if what by, I'm saying by is By gumming it up, it. by making it Using unworkable. Using it is not destroying it. It's you, well, well, of course it making is. it unworkable, if that's your If I pour sugar problem. in your gas tank, you can then hire more judges. I want to stop people from being deported from the United States. Absolutely. Okay. And the best so way to even do it people is to US, use the U.S. legal system, the, the justice system. Absolutely. To commit sabotage upon the legal system. It's an admirable justice system. Yeah. It's okay. a way of sabotaging and, and you would, the legal And you would, you would, you would take advantage of it, you would destroy it. Okay. No, so let me just ask you I want to sabotage your, it so it can't be used. Okay. I, I think one of the uh, uncovered sabotage, parts of this debate term. is the motive of the Mexican Pardon ruling me? class, of which you're a member, you went to Princeton, in all, the motive of the Mexican ruling class in wanting to keep some very large, uh, unknown number, but over 10 million, illegal immigrants in the United States rather than Mexico. Now, half of your country lives in poverty. Your, the tax rates on rich people in Mexico are the lowest in the region. My question to you is, rather than destroying our legal system, have you, have you paused a minute to think, well, why are these people leaving my country to go to the country next door? Maybe we should spend some time and like, build a social safety net rather than offloading the costs onto the American middle class. Has that occurred to you? No. No, it's occurred to me, and I don't agree with you at, at all on that, Mr. Tucker. I think the real issue here is that these are people who have been living on many occasions in the United States for 10 years, 20 years. They don't have papers. They may have entered without uh, papers, but they are there. They have children who are American citizens. In many cases, they are married to American citizens. They are law-abiding, hard-working people, and they have, there is no reason to deport them. You want to deport the criminals? Fine, but make sure they're really criminals, not just people but that all 
you of think, a sudden president. Okay, Trump but, but you're, you're actually dodging my question, which is of being criminals. No, I'm not. Why are they those people? No, yes, you are. Because, and have set down the, roots in the United States. They're there already. But why we can talk okay, about le- why did we can they talk about what okay. happens with future flows? You should. You should. Okay. What you should do you is legalize are, those. Hold on. Let me. Let me. Let me ask. Let me ask my question. Republicans, if you would. Right. I, I get it. The I'm filibuster thing. But, but this is a sincere question. So a, a huge That's percentage a of your population I'm, has I'm stating has my left. viewpoint. I'm not just answering your okay. questions. But why not? So you want to spend all this money to gum up and sabotage our legal system. Why wouldn't you spend money instead? And maybe maybe you could pay some more taxes to do this, because rich people in Mexico, and you're one of them, pay very little in tax, to build a social safety net that might keep people in Mexico. Half your population is in poverty, and yet you're spending money to keep them here. We're the pressure relief valve for your country. Do you feel good about that? Not to keep them there. That's where they they live, where they work, where they Because your country is dysfunctional. That's why. That's why. And by the way, I pay taxes in both... I pay taxes in both countries, so believe me, I pay. A well, you hell pay of a less lot taxes in Mexico. I have to pay in Mexico and in the U.S., which is fine. That's okay. the way it should be. No problem with but, that. But, but hold like, on. by the way, all of my my compatriots who are in the U.S. also pay U.S. taxes. That's something you and your network don't often mention. Mexicans, okay. with or without papers in the U.S., pay taxes okay. and very high taxes. But it's still. Now, but look, there's been yes, a lot of study on this, President and you're, you're, you're a college professor. Policies. Okay. I'm not going to shout over you. But look, remittances to Mexico are now a more significant portion of your economy than oil revenue. So actually, you need, Mexico needs the money from the over 10 million Mexicans living here illegally in order to function as a state. And my question again is, well, have you let, spent well, any time thinking you, about how to improve your own country your, that people won't want to flee as economic refugees? Let me just straighten out your, your numbers. So let me just straighten out your numbers to begin with. There's about 5.8 million Mexicans without papers. And there's another 6 million with papers who are legal residents of the United States. So it's not 10 million. That's untrue. That's, first of all, that's million. untrue. Secondly, Se- second, okay. well, second, well, well, those, are, those are the that's official wrong. U.S. Census Bureau. Those are official U.S. Census, no, census they're not. Bureau Whatever. Okay, figures. But, but and you you're not answering the yes, question. Are. Absolutely they are. The okay. second part okay. of your, your, also, your numbers are also wrong on the issue of how important remittances are. They're very important to many Mexican families, but $27 billion over a GDP of $1.5 trillion, I'm sorry, is about 3% of total Mexican GDP. But you it's don't have to slow, pay the social small. services costs not of over 10 million people. Poor people who've left your country. Look, yes or no, and we'll stop with this. Case, has in many has cases, this the social debate, services are paid for in many cases also. They are okay. also paid but for have in many you cases thought about because their families are in why? Mexico. Their families, okay. their children up. sometimes right. are in Mexico Maybe this also. works. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it. I, I urge you to think about that, though. Up next, we'll have a chat with the Washington Post media reporter. The subject, bias in his newspaper. Our, our nominally neutral press has mutated into an embarrassing gang of partisan shills. That's the accusation. Is it true? We'll be right back. Election Afterward, the press tried to blame its failure on a glut of fake news and then widely proceeded to publicize a bunch of bogus stories itself. Small wonder, then, that a recent Emerson College poll found that the public trusts the Trump administration's honesty substantially more than it trusts the media. One person who's supposed to be a watchdog over all this is Eric Wempel. He's a media reporter for the Washington Post, and he joins us tonight. Eric, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, pleasure. So, I read your, I'm in the media, I read your column, I read the Washington Post, I read it most of my life, and in the past couple of months, I've seen a lot of stories, including some from you, accusing people of basically carrying water for the Russian government. And that's the Russian government's in the news today. So I thought I would ask you about something I've wondered about for a long time, which is that the Washington Post, for years, many years, has literally carried paid propaganda from the Russian government, a, a section called Russia Behind the Headlines. It looks like newsprint. It's designed to fool readers into thinking it's real. And it's pure propaganda paid for, distributed by the Russian government, with stories like, you know, we're doing a great job in Crimea. Why have you never written about that? How can you attack others when you don't know that your own paper makes money from taking propaganda from the Russian government? You know, I think that's a really good question. Um, and uh, I wish you'd told me you wanted to talk about this, but no, those inserts are in- uh, interesting. Um, I mean, they are. Well, why part didn't of- you write about them? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, I got a lot to write about. But I, you know, I am interested in that topic, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, but it's your think, own but, paper. But hold on, hold on. You, I mean, you cover the media. Answer? I of do course, yeah, I'm just interested. I do cover the media. Um, and yeah. I believe there are several newspapers that do run these inserts. I think China has one as well. 
Um, right, that's right. They are what's known as native advertising, where there are um, signs to the reader that this is not your, you know, your approved uh, journalism. And I think do think that people, subscribers to the Washington Post and the New York Times and other places that run these things, can differentiate between the news that is in the paper proper and the news that is in uh, the Russia, China, so on and so forth, insert. That's really your uh, answer? Because they're, dis well, I would say two things. One, I remember a very famous piece that you did attacking Politico for running native advertising, mm -hmm. Mike Allen in particular, and you were all spun up into moral outrage over native advertising. And you never noted, again, that the Russian government is printing something in your paper designed to fool people, filled with the crudest kind of propaganda, but you didn't even notice it somehow. But I'm not surprised. Because in case after case, you fail to cover your own paper running fake or misleading things. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples in case you didn't see them. On February well, 14th, hold on, hold on, hold on. Washington... Yeah, hold on, uh, Mr. Carlson, I need to back you up there on that, uh, back up there on that premise. The thing that I wrote about Mike Allen was a different case altogether. Um, it was native a headline that said, it said native advertising pioneer. That was a cheeky way of saying that he was folding endorsements of companies and so on and so forth into the very text of his newsletter. There was no attempt whatsoever to differentiate that um, from his uh, from advertising. They had sponsors in that newsletter, and so okay. I reject the premise 100%. But you know, I. It, but you still can't answer why your paper intentionally tries to fool readers into believing that Russian propaganda is news, and that you haven't bothered to cover it. And no. your job is to cover the media. I think that's what it says in your column. But again, that's February fourth, your that's paper true. reports that Steve Bannon. It is true. Steve Bannon drives over to the Department of Homeland Security to advocate for Trump's executive orders. The, the story turns out to be totally false. It didn't happen. And by the way, your reporters never even called the White House to ask. That's fine, we all make mistakes. You didn't cover it. You didn't cover on January 26th when the State Department fired its entire management team. So said your headline. The story turned out did, to be totally a crock. You didn't did you, cover that. Did, Why don't did, you cover your own did, paper's shortcomings is the um, question. I think, I think you missed something, Mr. Carlson. Uh, would you look back, I believe it was in January as well, the Post reported something that wasn't quite straight about, um, I believe it was a power uh, plant up in Vermont. I wrote a very yeah. hard-hitting piece about that oh. situation. And if you go <laughs> no, you back... Did. It, it, no, you didn't. Me. I read the piece. You want to read what you read? What you wrote? By the way, your, two of your reporters reported that the Russian government had broken into and hacked the U.S. electricity grid. They were wrong. You said they were wrong. You never bothered to talk to your own reporters, presumably in the same newsroom that you're in. And here's did how you, you ended the you piece. Not read my, did you not read my post on that matter? I, not only did I read your post, no, you, I just reread it about 10 minutes ago, and you did not interview those reporters in there. You said that the paper I wouldn't talk to you. I interviewed, I really? pushed for an interview with uh, editor Marty Barron. They, look, the story the was very who wrote the piece? critical of the Washington Post. And I would note, was it? too, I would was note, Because here's the last Here, line, wait, wait, and I'm one quoting. Second. Wait one second, Mr. Carlson. Wait one <laughs> second, Okay. And okay. yeah, there's a high pitched yeah. laugh. I, I appreciate the high pitched laugh. Anyway. Uh huh. I appreciate anyway, your not, failing to few, give me an answer. Let, What's the answer? All right, there, there are few, if any, news organizations that allow their in house media reporter to do as much coverage of their own shop as Fred Hyatt and Marty Barron allow me to do. And I'll cite you a few examples. A year then you two, just declined to do it? Is that Hold what you're on, saying? They me. allow you, but you, you out excuse of cowardice, refuse to? Like, what are you saying? I did a story about, I don't know how many months ago, about the failure of the Washington Post to get diverse um, uh, 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 professionals in the higher ranks of the paper. I also broke the story within the wow, Washington Post. Wow, good for you, but you're not answering my questions about me, why you did. These me. are real stories, no, they're not no, about no, diversity in your newsroom. I and am you answering didn't it. interview the reporters no, no. who wrote the story. And then you end with this. The missteps mar an otherwise spectacular run for the Post. Now, when you write something that brown nosy, do you feel guilt? No. Do you feel finish, like I'm doing my job as a hard-hitting media me. reporter? Fin a spectacular finish, run of my finish. own publication, my own employers? Finish the post, Mr. Carlson. Read till the end, please. That's actually the no. last, that's the Read end of it. The and then end. you go Read the entire last paragraph, please, for me. Oh, is that is that where you interview the editor who assigned the piece, the reporters who screwed it up? You get to the no, question of how it happened. Oh, that look, wasn't I in don't the have piece. It in front of me. Because I you don't were afraid to me. track it down because you work there. Yeah. No. 
And I will continue. I also broke at the Washington Post the story of how this is a couple of years ago, a few years ago, the advertising side of the paper was putting the arm on the magazine to push content in a certain direction. You tell was it me, Russian propaganda? Oh, you missed that you story. Tell, you well, you're, tell you're, you're quite the sleuth, aren't you? you? Tell it's actually me. in the paper okay. when you open it up Mr. in the middle of okay. it. Mr. Carlson. Did you do anything on Brett Baer's report uh -huh. that, that there would be an FBI investigation related to the Clinton Foundation? What did uh -huh. you say? No, but I think, I think that you Hold did. On. Actually, Hold Eric, no, no, I think that you did. Let me talk. I'm, let me I'm not talk. the self-described media reporter. No, I'm just let me a, talk. Uh, oh, I don't cover the media. About, you do. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, you cover media every single day. I watch you. Ooh, you are everybody okay. on Fox News. Covers no, the I media. think that's your, this that's, is that's the your job, Eric. This is the of Fox News. Listen, right. Mr. Carlson, I want to ask... Well, you would know because you... you're a little obsessive about Fox News, I notice. You've covered Fox News in the last 10 months 23 mm -hmm. times more than MSNBC. And but, look, you've got a political agenda. You're a lefty. No, no. You're angry about politics. I get it. But no, here's my no. question to you. Does Jeff Bezos, who owns your paper, does Marty Baron, who edits it, do they ever call you and say, you know, good job, Eric. You're doing a real good job as a media critic. Do they ever tell you? I'm just in, a sincere question. Do they ever say that? Let me finish with an earlier point that you just seemed to steamroll me on. But what did you say when Brett uh, Pear reported falsely that there would be an FBI indictment, there would be a federal indictment related to the Clinton Foundation one week before the election against Donald Trump? Yeah. What did you okay. say about that? <laughs> As a media talk, reporter, what did we'll Howard have to go Trump, back to the tape. So you're saying, look, say you're, about that? Eric, look, I get it. You can't answer the question. So you're saying I that I somehow have an obligation to be a media reporter, but I'm not a media reporter, and you are, and you get a lot of mileage out of it. I'm Mr. Media Reporter, I'm brave, they right. give me all this rope and I can do whatever I want, but you don't. And instead, do. you single-mindedly pursue do. your political agenda, and my question is, please answer it, does the owner of your paper, Jeff Bezos, who runs Amazon, does he ever call you and say, good job, or does Marty Barron ever say, you're doing what we want you to do? Are, are you acting on their instruction? Do they notice what you're doing? What do they think of it? My direct boss is Fred Hyatt. Uh, I do not. Does he say directly. good job, I, Eric Wemple? Like really insightful. Does he ever I, say that? I'm, I I'm wondering. I, I wouldn't quote him as that, and I don't ap appreciate the puerile angle of uh, inquiry here. It's not puerile. It's sincere because I don't see you as a media critic. I see you as a political hack, acting out his political beliefs on paper with the cover of media critics. I'm just a media critic. No, I'm, and everyone who reads you knows that. And I'm wondering if does your do your editors know that? Do they l read it and say, you know, you're really covering the media straight? Do they think that? I, I, I believe I do cover the media straight. Today, for example, do you did really you see think what that? I wrote today? I questioned the New York Times as, as to how they gave a public wow. account of a reporter. You know, look. Oh, you, you questioned you your competitor. That's very brave. But do you ever right. question yourself? Do you I, ever question Mr. your own Mr. Carlson. Paper? I don't Mr. think Carlson, you do very I will, much. I will put the Washington Post's, in the freedom that I have, and the times that I uh -huh. criticize my own paper against yeah. okay. anyone well, in this industry. I know. Okay. Okay. I'm starting and, to feel bad for you. Look, the point is look, just actually, you have the freedom, and I, and I think it's great. You should just use it to do something useful, like reporting on Russian propaganda in your own paper. We're out of time. Eric, it's great Thank to see you. you. Thanks all for, for coming time. on. And I, okay. of course, I hope you'll come back. Up next, a former progressive just announced his own ideology in a viral video. His name is Dave Rubin, and he's here to say why he won't call himself a progressive now. We'll be right back. Glad to have you on after I saw yeah. this amazing. A video that you did that did go viral explaining why you're at least shifting. I don't know if you're abandoning all your former beliefs, but you're reorienting for sure. Could you just basically sum up what happened? Why you changed your mind? Yeah, well, you know, first off, actually, I believe the same liberal principles that I've believed probably since around 1988 when Michael Dukakis was running against George H.W. Bush, and I was in a, a social studies class where we were having a mock election, and I thought liberal was good. I mean, the, the issue that, that everybody's talking about, and by the way, I'm glad that I'm doing this tonight and, and with you because you're one of the few people in the mainstream that are, that are now talking about this. Uh, it's been bubbling up online for quite some time. And the, the progressive movement is no longer progressive. What progressive would be would be truly liberal, meaning for the individual, not for the collective, for liberty. I, I would welcome all your viewers to, to Google what classical liberalism is. It's about the individual and your right to, to do with your life what you would like. Uh, this is not what the modern left is about. So I actually believe the same exact things that I've believed probably for the last 
30 some odd years uh, and it, it's the left that has gone crazy and you know I know you know this but of course on all this free speech stuff and and judging yes. everybody on their immutable characteristics so if you're black we judge you this way and if you leave the group think you, you're a traitor if you're Muslim if you're trans gay etc etc th these are reverse of liberal beliefs and uh, it's been very sad to see this I, I've been trying to fight this on my show for for a good two years now and I, I suspect we've lost that war in that I've lost the left but I, I see an incredible new center developing where people that are liberal are now lining up and going wait a minute I, I see a libertarian who can come to the same right. agreement that I have we can believe the same things just looking at it through a different political lens so there's a beautiful moment happening here but of course it's lost in, in a big mess of of free speech craziness and authoritarian nonsense right and 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 part of the agreement that might bring people who disagree with each other together is that we're not going to use the legal system against each other if we can help it. So you had this line in here that struck out, stuck out at me. You said, I am gay and married. I do not believe that a baker or a florist or any business person ought to be forced to bake a cake for a gay wedding because if the government can force a company to do something for one set of ideals, they can do it for any. So you see this as a threat to you, potentially. Well, of course. I mean, look, you know, I should lay out, you know, I'm on Fox News and I know people freak out. Oh, my God, a liberal's on Fox News. So I, I should give you some liberal cred. Look, I'm for gay marriage. I even married a guy. I'm, I'm right. for legalizing marijuana. I'm pro-choice. I'm for reforming the prison system. And the list goes on and on. As for that specific line, I personally wouldn't want the government telling a private business what to do. Now, a lot of people will say, well, wait yeah. a minute, that, sound, that sounds libertarian. You just want small government libertarianism. Again, this is actually a liberal principle, and I think this is something that most people actually believe. And I know there's a lot of good people that would argue with me and say, well, what if you live in a small town and, and you know you have a, a a bigot is your baker in that one town unfortunately right. I think this is a case where you have to use your foot vote you have to then take your skills and your family and the money that you bring to the community and move somewhere else or order a cake online and I know that that doesn't feel right to a lot of people but that no, that I... in and of itself this this one person's bigotry shouldn't uh, be an excuse for more government overreach and again that is a That's liberal right. principle believe it or not yeah. It is, to, to the extent possible, you know, and there are cases where you have to, but try not to bother other people too much. <laughs> that's, that's one way to put well, it. Well, that's, that, uh, that's the funny yeah. thing, li that uh, live and let live is a liberal principle. And what I've yes, now I found know. over the last couple of years especially is that defending my liberal principles has become a conservative position. So I find I it easy suddenly to build bridges with, with people that you know, like uh, Glenn Beck and Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro, that are looking to go, wait a minute, maybe we can find some common ground with liberals. And I try to find, I often invite a lot of leftists on my show or progressives, and I get blocked or muted or, you know, otherwise uh, rejected. But I have had some too, and I, and I welcome those comments. Tell me about it. I, I know the feeling. Yeah, I, would, I, think, I, would I think we're probably on the same road on that. Yeah, we, we are on that. To, to look up your video online, it's, it's absolutely worth seeing. Thanks a lot, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Tucker. Up next, General Michael Flynn was brought down because intelligence agencies monitored him and then leaked the information they found to the press. Is the new administration being undermined by CIA employees with political axes to grind, or is something else going on? Rich Hume is here to talk about it next. Michael Flynn's downfall was swift, efficient, and clean, perhaps too clean. In just weeks, a major critic of the foreign policy establishment was politically obliterated, thanks in part to U.S. intelligence monitoring his private conversations. Is Flynn's rapid fall evidence that official Washington is trying to undermine the president? That may be a rhetorical question. Fox News senior political analyst Britt Hume joins us now. Britt, thanks for coming on. So the first question is not, how did this happen? But I just want to get to the outcome and your assessment of it. Was Flynn the right guy for this job in the first place, politics aside? I think, yeah, I think two things are true here, Tucker. One is that uh, the intelligence agencies apparently were bent on... Uh, undermining him and did so by the leaks that you described and tried to explain to your first guests and and I think it is also true that he probably wasn't the best fit for this job uh, right. Mike Flynn is a very strongly opinionated guy with passionate views and beliefs uh, and that is normally not been the characteristic of the National Security Advisor whose job it is principally to kind of organize and collate the viewpoints coming out of the agencies uh, for the president to make decisions based on. And his job, his job is then to neutrally present those views to the president. 
Uh, and, right. you know, some people have been criticized almost for doing that too well. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld didn't like Condoleezza Rice's performance as the National Security Advisor because she, she tried to work everything out and get it all settled between the, the differing parties so the president wouldn't have to make the call. He, you know, he thought that she should, that she should uh, let things be had out in front of the president. But that aside, right. The job is to get objectively as possible accurate information to the president, uh, representing all viewpoints so that he can decide. When you present inaccurate information, as he did in the case of what he told the vice president, whether he was intentionally lying or not is almost beside the point. You have fallen down on the job, and you know you, he probably needs someone with a more neutral temperament than Mike Flynn had. He's right. a decorated intelligence officer. He enjoys wide respect, but that doesn't mean he's the right man for this job. Well, that's, that's right. He may have been temperamentally unsuited for it. But it is sort of an ominous precedent, whatever you think of Flynn specifically, that the agencies, particularly the intelligence agencies, can undo someone using data gathered in surveillance. I mean, that has that got to put the fear of God into everybody serving in the executive branch. The CIA could, could crush me. Well, absolutely. And what, a, yeah, what looks like it probably happened here, Tucker, was that they're, they're eavesdropping on the Russian ambassador. And they pick up right. his conversation or conversations with Mike Flynn. They now are in possession through classified uh, information of very sensitive information on two counts. One is that the information itself is classified and having it get out might compromise sources and methods. And the second is that they've got information that they probably shouldn't have or shouldn't have been, shouldn't be, should be very careful with about the private conversations of a United States citizen. So that information is doubly deserving of the kind of protections th that the intelligence agencies are used to providing, and it leaked out. That may be a crime. So, you know, the question then becomes, you know, was Mike Flynn more sinned against than sinning? And I think that, it, right. as, we, as we talk here tonight, Tucker, that's kind of an open question. It is. But, and it raises the larger question that many people seem to be asking all of a sudden, can you possibly get a handle on a federal government that doesn't want you to run it. I mean, that's the question that the president may be asking himself. If you have all these permanent bureaucrats, some of them smart, knowledgeable, talented, who don't want your foreign policy, reject your views, can you actually effectuate your views? Yeah, can you govern? I, I, that's a, and I yeah. think that is a very good question and one that I'm sure they're worried about in the White House. There was an amazing story I saw, and I guess it was the Washington Post the other day, that was talking about uh, the difficulty the president might be having in staffing the National Security Council, which, and the National Security Council staff, which is a, has, be, has morphed into this great big agency, relying on people who are drawn from other agencies around the government who come, you know, they're, they're, they're borrowed to work on the, on the NSC. And it said that, it said, the story said that some of these people asked to be returned to their, the agencies where they came from because they didn't want to work for Donald Trump, for President Trump. Well, who did yeah. they think they'd be working for when they went back to their agency? <laughs> well, that gives you an idea of the mindset, doesn't it? <laughs> that these people are going to go back to the agency where they could merrily try to do all they could to torpedo the administration. And exactly. I, I, look, at the EPA and some of these other agencies, you've got to know, Tucker, that this is going to be going on and that, and that oh. running this government and taking it in a new direction is going to be about the hardest thing Donald Trump and maybe any recent administration has ever tried to do because the resistance is inside the government and outside. It's unbelievable. Britt Hume, thank you for that. As always, the perspective. We appreciate it. You bet. We're back with more in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. Say, Carl has bent the knee. For years, Viktor Orban has denounced efforts by Germany and other countries in Europe to welcome huge numbers of migrants from Syria, Afghanistan, and other countries. Now, Orban says there's one type of refugee he is willing to take, Europeans. Orban said his country will be, quote, happy to give shelter to the real refugees, Germans, Dutch, French, Italians, scared politicians and journalists, Christians who had to flee their own country, and those people who want to find here the Europe they lost at home. Oof. Hopefully Europe will come to a census before anyone needs to accept that offer. That's it. Have a great night. Sean